Okay, so didn't record the first comments about the exam. Uh, these statistics I drummed up from both last semester and this semester. So how I feel about the your performance on the midterm is actually I'm quite happy with your performance on the midterm, even if you aren't. And let's see if I can help explain why. So this is the fall 23 midterm. Now the midterm last semester was based on a 51 point midterm. So these numbers here don't sync up at all. However, this is based on a percentage. So the numbers in this final column are consistent. Oops, there we go. I'm just making it easier for you. Um, that's what I want. So last semester also there are a lot more students. There are about 100 students, whereas I have um, about 69 were graded this time around. 103. Uh, also one thing that makes this a little bit that skews some of these values, when you look at, if you can look at your midterm grade in the grade book and it'll show the both the median and the mean scores on the midterm, and those are pulled down lower than where they actually are because there are some people who withdrew in the course and for convenience in the spreadsheet that I put zeros in there. So it's bringing everything down. Uh, and same thing last semester. So it had eight people getting zero to nine points. Those are just simply people that got zeros because they didn't take the exam. Uh, but you can get an eye just by glancing at this. Also, I ha think there's an extra credit problem. So that's why there are a couple up here. So set aside the fact that there are nine because there are more students. Some got high, but you can see that it's really spread quite evenly. And there's kind of an interesting bump here in the 50 to 60 range, 50 to 70 range, I guess I should say. Um, really spread out and not that wonderful. If I go to what you all did, though, and I do that again, I'll never learn. OK, that's a little too aggressive. Now what you see is a really nice bell curve. And the average, before I put in the zeros, the mean score, I don't remember if it's the mean or the median, probably the mean was about 75. Uh, so that's where most of the grades fell, was in this region here. And um, yeah, so I said at the beginning of the semester that about a third of the people either drop out or fail this class. And I think, uh, I'll say this tentatively, but with a little bit of optimism that I believe the fail drop rate this semester will be a lot lower. So um, that's good. I'm happy about that. Uh, anyway, I said I didn't want to spend a lot of time. I guess I should talk very briefly about one or two items on the exam. Uh, let's see, it's going to be in documents, exams. Okay, so I, I wanted you to be able to read this, and it had to do with this one here, putting parentheses around stuff. Last. And you're not trying to solve a problem here. You're just simply trying to describe the order that things actually occur. Uh, once I got into it, I found that I had a problem with A because what you need to know to do A correctly is uh, the direction in which you re resolve the operator. Most of them are left to right, but there are a couple that go right to left. And it turns out I didn't have that information on this chart here. So it ended up being... Uh, one I couldn't fairly grade, so I didn't grade that one. Uh, but this is, hopefully you can intuitively see, at least as I explain it, that this has to resolve from right to left, meaning that you have to assign 5 to C before you assign C to B, before you assign B to A. If it wasn't that way, let's say B is 23, let's say that this is uh, 20, 30, and this is 5. If it, what, if it was left to right, then 20 would be assigned to A, 30 would be assigned to B, and then 5 would be assigned to C. And you see how that would be really, really confusing and how it seems to flow quite nicely if you go right to left. 
So I was looking for an inner set of parentheses here, then the second set of parentheses here, then the third set of parentheses here. Uh, anyway, I didn't grade it. Uh, this one creates a whole bunch of parentheses, and it was taking me too much time, so I said everyone gets two points for that one. <clears throat> uh, this one, positive A. That should be where your first set of parentheses are, then your second set of parentheses goes around the whole thing. This, you, again, um, need to look at the not and the minus, and you'll note that just as you learned in grade school, there are negative numbers, and that's actually represented in this chart. So this is a unary plus and minus, that's referring to those. So they're fairly high up in the chart at number three here, uh, far above addition and subtraction, which is at level six. So if I come back here, then that has to be, this is unary, that's unary, so you have a set of parentheses around each of those, and then a final set of parentheses around the whole thing. Finally, this one I threw in, uh, unless you've been doing a lot of C or C++ coding, you won't even know what that is. And the whole point of the exercise, and I think I actually said this at one point, is you don't need to know what it is in order to evaluate the order, in order to describe the order of evaluation in an expression in the language. All you have to do is look for this symbol, in that chart and look for this symbol in that chart and see which is higher. And we look here, we see that addition is at number six, but the funky little arrow thingy is up here at number two. So the arrow thingy must be occurring first. And you put your first set of parentheses around that and then your second set around the whole thing. Uh, this one, surprisingly, I guess it's a little bit tricky because four is greater than three. Uh, but other than that, if you're in grade school, here's how you do it. Grade school. Grade. Grade. <laughs> grammar school. All right. Problem number 23. What is 3 divided by 4? Well, actually, let me start with something different. What is... Uh, 6 divided by 4. How many times does 4 go into 6? What's the remainder? 24. Let's take 7 divided by 4. How many times does 4 go into 7? Once, remainder 3. Let's do 3 divided by 4. How many times does 4 go into 3? 0 times, the remainder is 3. If you were, if you put one as the remainder because you kind of did turn them around and did some sort of subtraction, then you're not alone. Many, many, many people said that the remainder was one. Uh, but this is this is the deal here, and so you know that division is zero, the modulus is three, so that's zero three, and then this is whatever the contents of this variable is, 3, an actual character. So this should be 3%, whatever's in this variable, which is 4. Now I've got double quotes around everything, so it should be the letter Y, the percent character in the letter, excuse me, the letter X, the percent character in the letter Y. Uh, I guess I can talk about this one very briefly. Uh, when you create a variable, all you can do is assign something to it, so there should just be a single equal sign here. This is perfectly legal in the language. Remember, the language is something that tries to evaluate expressions until it can no longer evaluate expressions, then it moves on. This is an expression that doesn't do much, but it's perfectly legal in the language. In fact, this right here when it's done evaluating this expression, it basically simplifies to 5 in a semicolon. First, the 5 gets assigned to D, then whatever's in D gets assigned to C, so on and so forth. Whatever's in B gets assigned to A. Now all you're left with is A, which is 5. There's no more work that can be done. Go to the next line of code. So uh, that is all that is. Uh, the problem with this for loop is these are commas, they need to be semicolons. Uh, this one is something that causes endless compile problems for people. It, when you're inputting a number, don't put the E in DL. The end line is for output, not for input. 
This one's wrong because the order of evaluation is always right to left, not left to right, with, the, with assignment. So you cannot assign B to 5. So that one won't work. And then this one is fine. All right. So I will, ooh, it's already 123. What do I got to do today? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to march forward at this point. And if you have particular questions or issues, feel free to post on Piazza. Feel free to post anonymously on Piazza if you don't want to reveal that you have a question about this exam. But let me redirect everyone's questions to Piazza. Okay? All right. Now I'm also, I'm very happy because everyone read Project 1. Is that correct? Yes. Hey, good. I'm glad that you all spoke with a unanimous voice. Project 2. Project 2. Project two. All right. Well, a whole nother story. All right. Yes. Is there anyone that forgot to bring a printout? Wes's was the first hand up. All right. This is <clears throat> What are we supposed to do in this project? Joust. What is joust? Um, okay. In the context of the project, why are we doing this? In the con it, 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 we're playing a role now, right? You're no longer in the classroom, but you're, you're wherever this stuff came from. What do you have to do in that context? Why, why are you in possession of this packet? Helping them with probabilities, probabilities for knocking off horse and others. Who's them? The knights. Helping the knights. <laughs> The, the, the knights are bits and bytes. They don't know any. You're not doing it for them. Huh? Bogey. Is that what I called it? Saber. Saber. Saberware. That's that's a winning company name. No, Bogey's the machine name. You're looking at in the email headers. You're looking at the machine name there. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, you work for say. Who are you working for Saberware? Huh? Okay, you are a new programming, I'll just say programmer with Saber Soft Software, Saber Where. All right. So if you're you're a new programmer with software, then what have you been asked to do? You have to create a test program to do what? All right, so what we can do is we can actually combine these two sentences into one sentence. Let me put that all by itself. You have to create a test program to help them with probabilities for knocking off a knocking off horse. Uh, I guess that becomes etc. 
knocking off horse. I heard you mentioned stamina, exhaustion. Mm, who's them? Who are you doing this for? Huh? All right. Each different weapon has different set of statistics, properties, something like that. <clears throat> um, uh, tell me about the senior developers. They want to borrow heavily from uh, test code. Your test code. Okay. Senior developers will want to draw heavily from code you write. Is that correct? Yeah. Who are we writing the code for? Who? The designers, all right, all right, all right. Have to create to help, that's what them is. Help game designers. All these notes will be uh, online. So these game designers want to create a game. It's a jousting game. And it has fallen to you to work with these designers. And what these designers want to do is this bit. This bit is actually a little bit important. They want to help them with probabilities for, for things that have to do with the joust. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly this game is. So there are some things thrown out here. Each weapon has different properties. Uh, our statistics, uh, the senior developers will draw heavily from the code. Uh, someone threw this out at the beginning. Um, give me, from the, from the materials, tell me more about what this game's all about. Uh, weapons have uh, hit percentages, knights have stamina, and can collapse from exhaustion. Is that right? Uh, what else? Age? Okay, but it, right, but the key word is then then one of the one of the designers says back off, you're a little bit too hot and heavy and fast with this. Let's we'll do get to that eventually, isn't that it says it more friendly than that. Yeah, yeah, but but that, that eventually the designers want to um, make the numbers and uh, what do I want to say make the statistics and calculations more complex and actually this this bit of criteria I'm going to lump with the senior developers will draw heavily from the code you write because both of these affect how you develop your code. Okay? If you're the only person who's going to see this code and it's never going to change, then you can get away with cutting a lot of quarters, uh, quarters, a lot of corners just to get the job done. However, if you need to do this for someone else and someone else plans on extending the code that you write, then you have to approach how you solve this problem in a different way. Okay? So that's kind of the takeaway from these two items here. Okay, so that ties a little bit to this. They're going to uh, want to get something going as quickly as possible. Um, when does the game end? Game ends when one player is knocked off horse.
Hmm. I'll say either. When either player is knocked off horse or exhausted. or a knight uh, collapses due to exhaustion. Uh, exhaustion occurs when stamina is reduced to zero. Yeah. What else? Is that both players can get knocked off? Yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, what if both players are knocked off the horse? Then how do we resolve that? Uh, this is so. This would be an example of where there's a bit of ambiguity, and you don't know what to do if they're both knocked off the horse at the same time. How you resolve it, and the way you would address that is to approach the designers and say, "What do we do in this case if they're both knocked off the horse at the same time? Do we?" Uh, say that the one with the highest remaining stamina is the winner or some other method and um, I, p me playing the part of the designer I'll just say you just call it a draw. But th that, that little exchange we just had is I don't want you to lose sight of that. So, the, so if I step out of what we're doing right now and I say that I'm, what am I doing up here as an instructor of C++ doing this exercise with you? It's not like because I like wasting time, but I'm trying to expose you to, to the process that you're going to have to use to solve problems. Well, you'll be doing it obviously on a much larger scale, right? And the thing that happens over and over again is not everything is laid out in the materials or the interviews with the client or whatever. There's always ambiguity, and it's a very human process to sit down with people and work through those uh, ambiguities. So I don't want you to lose sight that that's why we're doing, why I'm throwing this at you is precisely to show you that these things do happen. Yes? Another piece of ambiguity could be what takes higher precedence, stamina, or hit percentage of the weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, so another, and that ties in a little bit to whether it's a win or a draw or whatever. What, what's more important with regards to determining who wins, whether or not they're on the horse or whether or not they're exhausted? Um, <clears throat> I will say that from the sake of the designers, uh, they aren't concerned. They just want to know if one or both are knocked off a horse or if one or both are exhausted and they're not necessarily concerned with determining a winner other than to, to determine when that has occurred with one or both of them, either being knocked off a horse or being exhausted. So again, let, let's back up. The designers do not want you to write a game that's then going to go on a store shelf and sold. The designers, as was said... You have to create, you have to, let me, let me bracket this part. You have to, I'll leave that part. Let me, let me leave out the create a test program. You have to, to, there. You have to help, dang, you have to help game designers with probabilities for knocking off horse, stamina, exhaustion, etc. So the reason we're going through this is they have the genesis of an idea for this game and they need to actually kind of have knights and weapons thrown into a soup and be able to play with some values, right? What if uh, a weapon ha is able to knock a person off the horse 99% of the time? Is that reasonable? Well, you know, they want to play with numbers. Yes, in the back. Okay, so that's precisely why they say they want to come up with balanced numbers. So they want to experiment, yeah, right? Make it, make it kind of yeah, yeah. What else? Any anything that seems unsaid? Most, uh, like the higher effectiveness. 
Uh, the higher the effectiveness of the weapon, the greater the reduction in the stamina. Yeah, you know that that seems to be the uh, logical way to go about it. Is uh, maybe it has maybe a lance has a better chance of hitting than a sword, but it takes a lot more stamina to use a lance than a sword. I think that's a reasonable assumption. However, that's not an assumption we need to make since it's not us comparing values. Okay. Yes. Use more damage. No, wait. Yeah, go ahead. It's independent if a weapon gives you more damage and takes more stamina. Is that what you do? Or is that your bad? So repeat it one more time. If a weapon gives more damage and takes more stamina to use that weapon, or do we don't worry about that? Right, and you're just saying that it's in the document, yes? Yeah. All right. Yes. So. I think, yes, so as I said, I think it's a reasonable assumption. The designers, it's the designers that, that brought that up. Is that not true? Okay, so yeah, I think that's reasonable. But then, then the next question is, well, how am I going to figure out what those reasonable values are? Is it 5% the chance to hit and one requiring one stamina versus 10% chance to hit requiring 20 stamina? Or is that out of whack? Uh, and my answer to you when you start furrowing your brow wondering what those values should be you don't care you're the programmer you have to build a, a, a shell if you will for the designers to compare values it says that you want the test program to have the flexibility to enter weapon values from the keyboard or load them from a file you want the ex precisely in the document it says you want the pro be able to enter the values from the keyboard or from a file and if you read another the document after that it says hold off to the file so we're not dealing with files yet so they want to be able to enter values from the keyboard right so if you ask me how many weapons do I need to create for the knight to choose Todd do I have to create a sword and a lance and a, a morning star and a mace and so on and so forth, and my answer would be, you don't create any weapons. You merely ask at the keyboard for information about the weapon, and you type it in. And if you run it again, you type it in again. Right? So think if you're a game designer, and imagine the tool is finished, and you're these game designers. They're the ones that are going to say, okay, let's try a sword with uh, stamina required of 1 and a chance to hit of 5 and let's try a lance with a chance to hit of 10 and a stamina required of 20 and they run it and, and that knight loses every time who's holding the lance because it takes so much stamina to use it and so they go well let's lower that and experiment with different values and they do that all day long right it's the designers who are running your program over and over and over again putting in different values to figure out which ones are reasonable so assuming that the values are put in how does the game work? So I provide information about knights and weapons, then what? Huh? Well, you're having a number, number of rounds, right? You're having a number of rounds. Tell me about a round. Okay, so um, let's see. You have to uh, knights, blah. All right, we'll put it right here. Game is played in rounds. What happens in a round? In a round. Two knights, two knights, knights, clash, the other, all right, a little beetles there for you, okay, um, Well, two knights come together in a round. So what happens when the two knights come together? Hit chance and percentage. Uh, or excuse me. Hit chance and what? Well, I, I was saying hit chance and stamina. Because you want to make sure their stamina is not zero when they reach the middle. This is the decrement. Okay, so, so let me come back to this in a moment. Uh, game is played in rounds. Game ends when? No, I think I actually answered that, didn't I? Um, yeah. 
All right, let's take this down here. Game ends when either player, I guess that's fine, uh, is knocked off horse or night collapses due to exhaustion. Okay, that's when the game ends. So you start the game when you start the game up. Presumably, neither player is knocked off the horse, and neither player has collapsed due to exhaustion, right? And so they come together, and then what? Uh, they, the, we, the, the beginning of the round. They come together, and, and, and... They exchange, what do they exchange? Blows, they exchange blows, damage. Um, one thing that we, we, I, well, I want to ask the game designers is would they like the stamina to be decremented at the beginning of the round, like the night collapse before they even get to the middle, or is it like checked out the middle? To see the yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Do you want to, uh, so... So how does, why does your stamina get reduced? What are you doing to, that reduces your stamina? Okay, so uh, use, let me see, hit two knights clash, use weapon, and lose stamina. And so your question is, um, when does, what's the timing of that, right? And we will say that the timing in the time. So let's say that the knight has only one stamina left, and in order to use that sword, it's going to cost five stamina, which would be like a net of negative four. And so the question is, well, do you let the knight do it at all? And uh, I'll go ahead as a designer. I'll say that you know if they have any sort of stamina that's above zero, then you go ahead and, and let them wield that weapon one more time until the end of that. Until the end of that round, right? But there isn't a whole lot to a round, as we'll see. So uh, when I two knights clash come together, so a knight uh, I don't know why I'm using the funky quotes all the time wields wields a weapon, and when a, a knight wields a weapon. That's what I have here. Loses stamina, and what? And then what? Are we going to use chance to determine the big hit, or is it going to be based on the value of... There'll be chance, yes. There will be chance? Uh-huh. Yeah. So, uh, then has a chance of unhorsing the other knight. Is that correct? Or hitting, or hitting. Of hitting him. Like That's right. Has a chance of hitting the other knight. But according to the game designers, what happens when you hit the other knight? Huh? They get, off. they get knocked off the horse. So keep in mind that there's a distinction here between any of the the computer role playing type games you may have played and what's being discussed here. So what you have in most games is there's some reservoir of, of hit points or body points or whatever the game is calling it, and with each successful strike to the opponent, they lose some portion of their body points, and you're trying to drive that down to zero, right? Okay, that isn't the case here. The case here is that you are merely trying to see if the knight has successfully hit the other knight. And if the knight has successfully hit the other knight, then that other knight is knocked off the horse. Thus, ending the joust. So, if you're comparing bodies, see if it's above this, then you hit. If it's above this, then you hit. Or if it's below this, you don't. Or vice versa, right. So, if I, if I say that, that a, a weapon has a 20% chance of hitting, what you do is uh, you generate a random number between 1 and 100, and if it's 1 through 20, you hit, and if it's 21 through 100, you miss. Okay? That, that ends up being a 20% chance. Now the question is, where do you get the random number from? Uh, that is code that I provided, and we'll talk about that more moving forward, but you do not have to write the code to generate a random number. I provided that for you. You could. You definitely want to use a loop of some sort for each round. Yeah. Yes. So the first thing we have to keep around is 
Uh, good question. So at the end of each round, do you do some sort of reset? There is no reset. The values just stay stay the same, and the, the stamina is gradually decreasing. All right. So uh, what I Friday. So I thought I was going to get the, to this today. Didn't have a chance in getting to it today. Uh, Friday will be a very uh, important day to, to kind of bring this to life because there's a whole lot of head scratching happening here right now. We do not have nearly enough information. We're going to get the rest, some more information out. We're going to do, I'm going to bring a bunch of people up here. We're going to do Joust live on stage. Okay. So if you, if you have your Renaissance Fair costume, bring it, and I'll let you be up front. Yes. Yeah, and the word, the, the word of the day. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Homunculus, a miniature adult that in the theory of preformation, this is a 16th century theory, is held to inhabit the germ cell and to produce a mature individual merely by an increase in size. So there was a period of time where the local alchemist or uh, related role was saying that how conception occurs and how babies are born is that neither in the sperm or the egg of, of uh, the parents, there is a little, little, teeny, tiny human fully formed, and that just, it's like blowing a balloon, and the human gets bigger and bigger until the baby's born. And so that's uh, referred to as a homunculus. All right, definitely come.